so today is the second lecture, um, talking a bit about cardiac function. Um, it will be relatively basic. So as I said, it will be the, these classes will be a combination of basic stuff and more advanced stuff. So I want to cover a couple of basic things still in the beginning. Uh, and then later on, we can go into, into more advanced stuff. And as I said before, if there's something that you want to be covered soon, just let me know and send me an email. Also, if you're interested in re-watching this or sharing this or whatever, I created a YouTube channel. I think if you search for my name in YouTube, you probably will find the channel. Otherwise, uh, if you send me an email, I can send you the, the direct link. Uh, if you want to look at it. What I would always also do is besides these lectures, um, I'm teaching some classes for the engineers on imaging modalities. And actually now this year, since everything had to be online, I recorded uh, several of these classes and I will put them also there. So if you're interested in that, then, then uh, you can watch that there also. Okay, so to continue where we left off um, last time. So what I've been saying before is that when you look at cardiac structure, it's actually quite, quite complex. Eh? And so uh, especially the inner side of the, of, of the wall, so the endocardium is very trabeculated. And as I said before, that's actually advantages in order to have like a little bit of the spongy uh, working of, of, of the heart. So in order to make an, an optimization between the volume that is being pumped out while being able to uh, develop the pressure also that is needed depending on the left or the right front. Now, one of the things that I also mentioned last time is that, so we start from a basic building block, which is the cardiomyocyte. Eh? So which is a very elongated uh, cell that can, when electrically stimulated, can start to develop force and then shorten, but only shorten by 10 to 15%, not much more. And so, as I said before, and we'll come back to that later on, with every heartbeat, a ventricle is able to eject about 60% of its volume. So in order to do that, these cardiomyocytes have to be arranged in such a way that this 10% shortening can actually translate in this large displacement uh, within the cavity. And one of the things that is crucial for this is how these are oriented within the cavity. And also what I told you before also is that, of course, mechanically, you have to see for the force transduction from in the direction of this myocyte towards the pressure, which is, of course, uh, perpendicular to the endocardium by definition. And what you see there is, is and that is shown in, in this slide, is that actually there's a very peculiar, a very particular way that, that cardiomyocytes are actually oriented within the wall of, of within the muscle of, of the, the ventricles, and that actually changes from uh, depending on their position within the wall. And it changes actually gradually from the epicardium, so the outside border towards the endocardium, the inside. And what you can see, and you see it here on this morphological specimen in some ways, is that when you look at the outside uh, of, of the heart, you see that the, these myocytes are actually arranged in fiber-like structures. They're not really fibers. Some people or the, the purists call it like myocyte aggregates. So it's actually how individual myocytes are connected to each other, but they don't form perfect lines, but they are roughly arranged in that direction. So for sake of simplicity, we will mostly talk about fiber arrangement. And what you'll see is that the cells are oriented in a longitudinal direction. So that means from the base of the heart where the valve plane is towards the point of the heart, the apex, roughly at the outside, at the epicardial, roughly longitudinal. So that means that when you make a cut, huh, and so these cuts, these are actually synchrotron images, um, where you make a short axis cut, so you cut it kind of uh, perpendicular to this, this base apex plane. And what you see there is that at the outside of the heart, you see that you actually cut the cells in their short axis also. Huh? So the cells at the outside are longitudinally oriented so that you have like a very small circumference as this if you cut it. 
And then the deeper you go within the myocardium, so the more you go from the outside towards the inside, what you see is that the, the, the uh, angle of these myocytes are actually gradually changing. And so you see that you come that when you come at the inner, the, the middle layer of the myocardium, you see that you actually have these cells really in the circumferential direction. And then when you go further towards the endocardium, you see that they actually become longitudinal again. So we have this gradual change in direction depending on the position within the wall. And so we have, people talk something sometimes about that the, the, that the left ventricle has these three layers, this like longitudinal, circumferential and longitudinal layer, but actually it's really a very gradual change. It's an almost linear change in the orientation and the angle of the myocytes uh, uh, with regard to this long axis. And you see that when you look at a whole heart, so th this kind of middle image, it's actually a rat heart uh, that has been imaged ex vivo. And we go from the base of, of, the, of the ventricle towards the, the apex. And what you now, now also see is that it looks like you have this kind of spiraling of these, these uh, fibers. And so you really have that, that the fibers are oriented in this way. So, so you have at the one hand, that they go from longitudinal towards circumferential towards longitudinal again, when you go from the outside to the inside. But then of course also they have a certain obliqueness in such a way that when you would go through it, it looks a little bit like the spiral-like configuration. What you also see, and, and here is like a quantification of this kind of fiber direction, you see that that's also very homogeneous in a normal heart. Eh? So you see that everywhere in the epicardial layer you see that you have this kind of longitudinal orientation everywhere in the mid, you have the same orientation and the same is in the endocardium. Although in the endocardium, you have to keep in mind that of course you have these trabeculations. And what you see is that actually within the trabeculations, you see that the cells are of course following these trabeculations. Eh? And what you see is that most of the trabeculations, and you can see that here also, the, the predominant direction of these trabeculations, at least if you go a little bit to the mid, is in this longitudinal direction, but not completely. Eh? So that makes the endocardium actually much more complex with regard to both the sponginess, but also how uh, the cells are oriented there. While, as we said before, the epicardium is very, very smooth, is very, very homogeneous. So when you have, or thanks to this orientation and some of the other classes, we can go a little bit deeper into this and, and in different pathologies, but thanks to this orientation, what you will see is of course, when cells develop force and when they shorten, they can create these different components of deformation right, within the myocardium. So if you have here again, you see another specimen. So you see the outside uh, uh, kind of layers are more or less from the base towards the apex. Keep in mind that they're oblique, which is also still important for rotation. Well, we come back to that later on. So of course, when these cells are contracting, what they do is they develop a force in order to drag this base towards the apex. And so to have what we say, like a change in the longitudinal direction of the heart. So what happens is that this, the base, goes towards there. And so you see a shortening in this longitudinal direction. If we get these mid myocardial fibers, which are really circumferential, so over the circumference of, of, of the ventricle, if these contract, what they obviously do is they shorten the circumference. Okay? And so you get, what happens is that the total circumference is becoming smaller. And that's what we call the circumferential shorten. So this is like a second component. Keep in mind, these are not, kind of real components and directions of the myocardium right? because these cells, as we said before, there's a continuous change. So it's really a complex 3D change, but for clinical simplicity, and we will see later on that this actually has a, a, a very uh, useful meaning with regard to, to diseases. What we do is we split it in this longitudinal component, so base to apex, and the circumferential component where the circumference is, is changing. Now, another thing that you have to keep in mind is that myocardium, so that's tissue, elastic tissue, but it's still non-compressible eh? because the only thing in our world which is compressible is gas. And so when you compress a gas, it can change its volume, but neither liquids nor solids can change their volume. So that means that when you shorten it in this longitudinal direction, 
and you shorten it in the circumferential direction, the total volume has to remain the same. So that means that it has to thicken in the radial direction. Yeah? So although we do not have cells that would kind of make this radial direction larger or would move actively the, the inside, so the endocardium towards the middle, because that's the component which would contribute to a change in the volume, of course. So this component is radial thickening that is often also measured uh, in echocardiography. This radial thickness is actually the passive result of longitudinal contraction, so longitudinal shortening and circumferential shortening together with non-compressibility of the tissue, which makes that you need to have radial thickening. Now, non-compressibility, um, this is in the physics uh, way, this is of course exact. Now in the myocardium way, what actually happens is that actually the volume can change during the contraction because of the fact that of course we have also vessels within the myocardium eh? and these vessels contain blood. And what actually happens is that during systole, so during the contraction of the myocardium, what happens is that actually the blood is being squeezed out of the tissue. And when you also look at it, so, so the heart is the only organ which actually fills with blood during diastole. Okay? Because during systole, during the contraction, the blood is actually squeezed out of the myocardium. And so when you squeeze out this blood and you collapse then the vessels inside of the, of the muscle, you have roughly 10% change in, in the tissue volume, about would be say roughly 10%. The other thing is also, as we said before, is like the, the, the uh, trabeculation, they act as a sponge. So what you will have there is that trabeculations will close without this deformation of the tissue. This is exactly why we have these, these trabeculations. Eh? So that means that apparently sometimes on the images, especially when we do not have a, a great resolution, what looks like this closure of the, of, of the trabeculation can look like more thickening of the muscle when you look at it with, with some of the imaging. So these are the things that, that, that play a role. Right? So we have the longitudinal component, longitudinal shortening, because of the component of the myocytes uh, shortening in that direction, we have the circumferential change, and then we have the radial thickening, all of it keeping in mind the blood being squeezed out during the contraction, and then that the endocardium is quite uh, much more complex, especially towards the apical part, and certainly in the right ventricle, where we have these trabeculations closing. But in general, the way that we, we look at this uh, when we talk about cardiac function and deformation is that we measure somehow how we have this change in dimensions in this longitudinal direction, how we have a change in the circumference, and then how we have thickening of, of, of this myocardium. We'll come back to that uh, later on. Here you nicely see actually on this, this MRI, this is an MRI tagging image. You see how this longitudinal component, so you really see here is the valve plane, eh? and you see how this valve plane is actually moving towards the apex. What I told you before, here you also clearly see that the outer contour of the heart is actually totally not changing, and that actually the position of the apex in a normal heart is stationary within the, in the wall. Although the apex is not connected to anything, eh? so the apex can really freely move within the pericardial sac. What you see is that because of the, in the end, is because of all the balance of forces around it, what happens is that your base, your, your valve plane is being dragged towards the apex and in a normal heart in a very, very smooth, homogeneous way. The thing that you can also see here is actually when you look at this right ventricle here, what you see is that actually the amount of longitudinal deformation of the dragging of the valve towards uh, the, the apex is actually larger in the free wall of the right ventricle than in the left ventricle. Because also when we start looking at the fiber orientation of the right ventricle, what we see is that actually the right ventricular fibers, the outside is actually circumferential. So we don't have this again longitudinal. So in the right ventricle, what we have is that the predominant trabeculations and the endocardial wall are longitudinal. And then we go towards circumferential towards uh, the outside. So that's also different uh, from the left ventricle. But in the end, 
these are the components. And now there's different ways of looking at it. Eh? So one, one thing would be is that we really measure how much deformation is taking place here locally within the tissue. I'll come back to that in a minute. But one of the things that you see also is that in, in an easy way, because of the fact that we know that the apex is stationary, if we would look at how the ring, eh, so how the valves are actually moving towards the apex, both looking at their velocity or the amount of displacement that they do, this actually also tells us something about uh, the deformation. And what we will see later on is that this is actually relatively easy or robustly measurable with, for example, ultrasound. One thing also that I still have to men uh, mention, again, we'll go into detail later on, but by the fact that actually the outer uh, fibers, as well as the endocardial that you see here, are not completely longitudinal, but they're actually oblique, what happens is obviously when they would contract, what happens is that you get a rotation of the base and the apex. Eh? So, so because of this obliqueness, you see that the base and apex rotate. So we actually get this torsion of the, the whole ventricle so that when you look at the overall motion of the ventricle during the contraction, what you have is that you get this really squeezing down of the valve plane towards the apex, at the same time changing the circumference of the, the endocardial layer predominantly, well, of actually also the mid layers and things like that. And then you have this additional kind of inward motion of the endocardium because of this thickening. Keep in mind that there's no circumferential change, of course, of the outer border, because what we said before is that the total uh, uh, volume or the total circumference of the heart is not changing eh, in order to keep the volume uh, constant during the cardiac cycle. Okay, now we have different ways to, in order to look at, at how this function is taking place or to quantify this function. Eh? So um, a lot of, of this course will be uh, about echocardiography because in general, echocardiography is like what, what we can say the workhorse of, of cardiac imaging eh? with, with more than 90% of, of imaging being done in cardiology based on echocardiography. The other advantage of echocardiography also is that it has a very good temporal resolution. Right? It's, it's like a, a really real time technique if we go towards 2D and Doppler at least. Um, and that's also one of the reasons why looking at the motion uh, is important. Now, again, as I said before, there is this, there will be separate videos on, on cardiac imaging and, and ultrasound imaging and things like that. And during the sessions, we will regularly come back to this. But what we will see is that when we look at echocardiography, we have different modalities or different types of images that we can get information from that can be useful in order to evaluate function. So one typical one is the M mode, where we just look at, at one uh, line and we look at function of time and we see how the endocardial walls are moving towards each other. And we can actually also nicely see the thickening. Obviously, having anatomical images, predominantly 2D, potentially 3D uh, uh, were useful, that tells us something about both the structure, so the geometry and then the functioning. What is also very, very important in clinical practice, unfortunately not enough of research is being done on this, but uh, this might be changing also, is like looking at Doppler velocities. Eh? So with that, we can look at velocities of blood predominantly through valves or, or, or through vessels. But we'll come back to that later on, how this is useful. One thing that we can also do is measure velocities of tissue. And you can do things with that also. we we'll come back to that later on. And then obviously regarding to flows, but that is mainly to look at flow patterns or to look at leakages of valves or connections that are there that shouldn't be there. We can look at, at kind of color Doppler, but we'll come back to many of these later on. Now, as we see, as I said before, so you have these different components of the deformation of, of, of the ventricle, and in the end, that will eject a certain amount of, of blood. Now, in order to look at the overall function of the heart, what we clinically mostly do is we measure volume-based parameters. And so one of the things that we measure is we look at the size of the heart, and we look at the size of the heart at end diastole and end systole, and so, of course, the change in size that determines the amount of volume that is being pumped out 
with one heartbeat. That's what we call the stroke volume. Eh? So the amount of volume. So, so, and then of course, if we multiply the stroke volume by the heart rate, we get the cardiac output. Eh? So the, the amount of liters of blood per minute that is being pumped out by the heart, which is determined by what is needed by the body, as we said before. Whether you do exercise or not, that makes a difference, for example. But what we often do is in order to look at uh, the functioning of the heart or how well this, this ejection is taking place, is that we look at the percentage of change, the percentage of volume that is being pumped out with every heartbeat. And that's called the ejection fraction. Right? So the ejection fraction, what we take is we take the end diastolic volume minus the end systolic volume, so that's the stroke volume, divided by, so, so kind of normalized by the end diastolic volume, and that put in percentage. So that's the ejection fraction. So it's the percentage of the volume that is being pumped out with uh, every heartbeat. Now, you can uh, simplify this with fractional shortening, uh, 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 fractional area change. Some, some people do it, say that also. So that is saying like, okay, how is the dimension, either the linear dimension in one direction changing or the dimension changing in a 2D plane so, so that the percentage change can be used also. It's partially historical, I come back to that later on, but it also has uh, potentially different meaning. But the ejection fraction is actually the most used. And the thing is, why do, do clinicians still use ejection fraction while it has a lot of uh, disadvantages? Well, that's actually based on a couple of studies that, that have been done, which actually tells you that ejection fraction is actually a very prognostic factor. Because when we look at kind of death or heart failure or things like that, then we see that with a reduction of the ejection fraction, we get an increase in the hazard ratio or in the amount of problems that the patient has. And with ejection fractions below 30%, for example, what we see is that these patients are at very high risk in order to die or develop heart failure. Now, this is done on large population studies. And if you have a patient with a very, very low ejection fraction, then of course we know that that's a patient which is very sick and, and at very high risk. But especially when we go to these ejection fractions, which are like intermediate, something like 40%, 50%, 55% even, what we know is that in, on a population level, that has increased risks. Yeah? So the lower your ejection fraction, your risk increases. But it's not necessarily that a certain patient with a certain ejection fraction has a certain risk. So it's very different, difficult to translate what you find at the population level sometimes to the individual level. And this is actually one of the things that you see very often in cardiology is that, that some of the parameters that we use to measure things and then use thresholds, for example, to, to make a certain decision. This is very often based on cohorts or large studies but translating that to the individual is often very difficult. Eh? And that's where we see that we uh, have to do much more data integration. Or as I said before, also trying to understand what the underlying disease is. But anyway, ejection fraction is still something which has to be measured with every uh, um, exam that we do and which is still being used to make major decisions partially because of lack of, of a robust uh, alternative, but also we come back to that later on. And uh, ejection fraction is of course based on measuring volumes. Eh? And uh, the thing is, there's a lot of ways to measure volumes. And here is a couple. Eh? So, so one of the things is that we need to do some segmentation. So we need to determine endocardial borders at end diastole and systole and then ideally in different directions or in different ways in different planes in order to do it robustly. We can do it extremely simplified just based on the M mode eh, where we just measure the change in diameter. Uh, but that, uh, I show that in a minute, uh, assume some kind of geometrical assumptions. You can do it by just measuring an area and measuring a length. Again, that is based on assumptions or you can really do 3D uh, measurements. 
here is some of these geometrical ways. So it really depends on how many things you measure in the end, how many areas or uh, diameters you measure, then you can fit some kind of, of, of geometrical function or, or geometry through it in order to try to determine uh, accurately or as accurately as possible the volume. Obviously, when you have an extremely remodeled, so this would be like a, a very bad case of, of an apical aneurysm, for example, after a large infarction, we will see that the simplified ones are actually kind of totally wrong because of this geometry. And the more 3D we go, or the more measurements we do, of course, the better. Now, is it always that simple? It's like the more detailed we go, the better. Well, yes and no, eh? because one of the things, so here you see an example, this is actually an example of a pediatric heart. Uh, one of the things that you see is that when you start to do these delineations, well, things are not always that obvious. Eh? For example, what do you do with trabeculation? So you have to cut these trabeculations. What do you do with dropout of the images? Because a lot of, of, of especially dilated hearts in echocardiography, you see dropouts. It's like, what is the endocardium and what is the epicardium? So here, this is a child, so it's quite easy to see, but very often in adult hearts, it's not that easy to see. So still, you see that there's a lot of potential errors there. Right? Then we can go to 3D measurements, huh? which of course gives you much more uh, detailed uh, anatomy, but keep in mind that currently 3D imaging, especially by echocardiography, has a limited spatial and temporal resolution. Now, MRI is better in some ways, and, and we can do uh, uh, MRI kind of quantification, sorry. So we can measure the, the anatomy with MRI in a better way, but keep in mind, MRI also has disadvantages. Huh? For example, the temporal resolution of MRI, if you do kind of contemporary good MRI, you can maybe do 40 frames per second, but uh, we'll come back in another uh, session about what is really the temporal resolution that we need. But for example, when you have a patient with a left bundle branch block or during exercise or things like that, what you can actually show is that you actually need a few hundred frames per second in order to resolve everything. Now, is that relevant for an ejection fraction? Potentially not, but still you have to keep that in mind. Similarly, also what to do with trabeculations, that's also still a big problem in, in MRI. And so when we make volumetric calculations, and so here you see a delineation of the endocardial border, one of the things that you see is like, what we see there is we see a smooth endocardial border. So from imaging, we extract smooth borders. But what I showed you on, on the, the pictures before is that the endocardium is not smooth at all. Eh? So we have these trabeculations and they are actually potentially quite important. Now, are there different ways to measure volumes? Well, yes, actually we have still different ways. So what we can do is actually we can measure it based on looking at the hemodynamics, for example. Eh? So a stroke volume, we can measure by kind of calculating the area under the curve of the Doppler. And so making the temporal integral of the Doppler velocities and then multiply it by the area of, of the valve at which we, we measure it. And this way we can do it. also with advantages and disadvantages, but we have different ways in order to measure this. And they can be complementary. Yeah? Now, what is the measurement? What is the correct measurement? Well, that's a big problem. And that's one of the big problems in, in, in cardiac imaging. And that's where still a lot of research is being done. It's like when you compare all these different ways in order to measure, um, for example, volumes or stroke volumes or ejection fractions, what you see is that they actually correlate but don't correlate greatly. And that is because of the combination of whether you really look at the, the full 3D anatomy what do you do with the trabeculations? Do you include them, exclude them? Do you properly see them? Yes or no? For example, with Dopplers, when we measure the size of the valve, is a valve circular in diameter? Or actually, in reality, a valve can be kind of very complex shaped. So what is the actual area and things like that? So in that sense, it's like whatever imaging technology we, we use, we always measure something different. And then again, depending on the imaging technologies and then the method that we use in order to do the measurement. So for example, the segmentation, like nowadays, especially when we use deep learning or machine learning in order to do it, it can be more or less reproducible also. But with reproducibility, very often, 
what we see is we see some kind of smoothing or a standardized way to deal with the trabeculations, which not necessarily is the best way for an individual patient. So even though volumes and ejection fractions are the standards, keep in mind that even within the technology that we have, we have some limitations. So what do you see then partially in reality when you look at, at reporting? And, and I find this a very, very interesting way in looking at this. So this is actually the measurements of ejection fractions from a clinical trial. So in this case, the mated CRT trial. So that's a trial of patients with reduced ejection fraction and heart failure. And one of this kind of inclusion criteria of this trial is that the ejection fraction of the patient has to be below 30%. Okay? So that is severe reduced ejection fraction with heart failure. So you say in a, in a trial, you include these patients. So you let the people measure the ejection fraction. And because the ejection fraction is an inclusion criteria, you also tell them to measure it in the best way possible. So they really have to do an effort to measure. One of the things that you then see when you look at the measurements that have been done at inclusion is first of all, that you see at multiples of 10 or multiples of five in this case, you see actually a peak in the histogram, which is of course weird eh? because when you look at a larger population, I think this were a couple of thousand patients or something like that. What you expect is you expect a Gaussian distribution of course, or at least a smooth distribution. What you see in the reporting is that actually people very easily round to the nearest 0.5. Is that because they measured it improperly or is that, that because they just, while reporting it, kind of uh, uh, rounded off or not? This is completely unclear. Eh? And when you then see the measurement that is then being done by a core lab, so with the same people, with the same technology, with the same kind of way of doing it, then you see that you exactly get a Gaussian distribution. And one of the things that you see is that actually also even a lot of patients are actually above the inclusion criteria rather than this heart inclusion criteria is there. So here you see already that also the way we measure it, the purpose we measure it for, how it's being measured, how it's being standardized will actually, actually also make a difference in these calculations. Now, why is this also relevant? Well, first of all, to say that this is not a very reproducible um, or, or kind of reliable measurement in some ways. But on the other hand, and again, that's something to go in more detail with another uh, um, kind of talk. What we see is that actually that there's some guidelines, for example, in, in follow-up of patients with cancer to look at, at cardiotoxicity to at cardiac problems of chemotherapy. What we see there is that a change of 5% in ejection fraction actually means that we have to reconsider the use of chemotherapy in some ways. But if we see that already ejection fractions are being rounded to 5%, even in an ideal setting, and what we can also prove is that the, the measurement accuracy that we have is also roughly five, even closer sometimes to 10%, then we see that we actually really have a problem with this kind of things in the individual patients. Huh? And so there's a lot of limitations uh, in, in doing these measurements. So how do we then look at cardiac function? Well, that's one of the things which makes it uh, a lot more difficult. Huh? So as I said before, there are first of all these technical limitations which are related to the imaging we use and the way we want to quantify these images. But on the other hand, and that's something that we haven't discussed yet, there's actually also a lot of physiological limitations, right? Because actually, if you measure the ejection fraction now, and then you give the patient a coffee to drink, and then you measure it a little bit later, uh, or after they went to the toilet, for example, what you will see is that they actually have different ejection fractions. So there's a lot of physiological variability. So what do we look for then? Or how can we improve this? Or how can we integrate this, this in, in uh, different information? And so one of the things that we start to look for more and more is looking at really deformation itself. So not just the volume change, eh? because actually keep in mind this volume change is actually also somehow a deformation. Eh? So because what you do when you take your end diastolic volume and then you look, take your end systolic volume and you calculate the percentage change, you're actually calculating what the percentage changes of your myocardium in some ways also. Eh? So you're looking already at deformation. So ejection fraction is a rough global measure of deformation. 
Now we can actually look at deformation in more detail eh? because one of the things that I also mentioned last time is that when we look at different segments of the myocardium, they are actually, because of the fact that they have different perfusion, that they ha can have a different structure, they can actually also deform differently in some way. And so what we want to do is we want to quantify this. And so a way to look at it is kind of trying to measure strain, as we say, or deformation. And strain is actually the change in the kind of length or size of an object with regard to an original size. So we, for example, have a piece of tissue, it contracts, it shortens. And if we now look at the percentage change that has been taking place with regard to the original, that's what we call the strain. And so you can already see that the strain, so the deformation of the myocardium will actually change the inner diameter or the inner position of the endocardium. So the strain relates to how much volume is being pumped out in some way. Now, when we look at the heart, it's not only the amount of deformation which is important, but actually what is also important is how fast this deformation is taking place. And that's what you see here. So you see that in total, these two pieces of myocardium have the same amount of deformation during the cardiac cycle. But of course, the bottom one does it double as fast as the, the top one. So the rate of deformation can be different. And that's what we call the strain rate. Obviously, they are related eh? because just like velocity and displacement are related, strain and strain rate are related through a temporal uh, derivation. Now, how can you roughly interpret strain rate? Well, one of the things is that if we have a certain heart and if we increase the contractile force, then of course the contraction will happen faster. Okay? So what we will see is that the faster the heart will contract or the faster a piece of myocardium will contract, the more force in some ways is being used. And so it's more closely related to contractility. But this will become uh, uh, more clear in the next sessions. And I think this is enough for today. So we covered a little bit of rough uh, function as being an ejection fraction and volumes with its advantages and disadvantages. And then we started to say like, look, maybe we'll have to look at deformation. And we have to link that obviously at some point to the structure of the heart. But about that next time more. Any questions? I, I can ask. Uh, thanks a lot, Bart. You are a very good teacher, I would say. Um, just about here at the strain, uh, just to clear, I mean, I know, but I guess maybe not everybody, what we measure as strain, here you have the myocytes, but what we are measuring is not really this, what we can measure in the images is how much the myocardium turns. And yes. again, fortunately, it's not as good as this. No, exactly, exactly. But that's what I also said, said before. Eh? It's like there's different ways to look at, at cardiac function. Eh? So what we would like to do is look at the individual myocyte level. That's obviously impossible unless exactly. you would, would isolate cells or do it in a very controlled tissue culture. So in reality, what we need to do is we need to look at chunks of myocardium. But as I said before, within these chunks of myocardium, because of this fiber orientation, the directions of each of these myocytes is changing. And we always see the kind of total, the integrated results of this. Eh? So, and then we get this complex deformation, which is related to the, uh, the intrinsic structure. And as I said before, then even the vessels change or the change in volume of the vessels and the change in trabeculations actually makes it more difficult. Actually, also one of the experiments we're currently doing, and that is uh, Hector de Gea is doing that in the synchrotron, is trying to see how fiber orientation or how individual cells and brackets are changing during contraction in this tissue. And then you see that things actually are very, very complex. Eh? I hope one of the, of the next classes to talk a little bit about that. And then you see that actually the deformation within a piece of tissue is very, very inhomogeneous. And as this kind of this change in vessels is very important. The change in the trabeculations is very important. 
and there's a mm-hmm. difference between endocardial and, and epicardial that's also very, very different. So the only thing that we see is the overall integrated uh, change in size, so the deformation of a block of tissue. And then even with imaging, as I said before, our resolution of clinical imaging is actually crappy in some ways that we even see it very smooth. Yeah. Now looking forward to see this. Thank you. Good. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you for being here. And um, it will become available also on YouTube. So there's the YouTube channel. Subscribe if you want and send it on to everybody that might be interested. So thank you and see you next week.